Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Thank God for another opportunity to share with you a Bible lesson. We are still in the book of Romans. We have been looking at teaching on sanctification. We started with positional sanctification. Now let's look at practical sanctification. You know, we have already been justified in the sight of God. We have been declared righteous in the sight of God. Paul tells us that we are to know some things that God has done on behalf of lost sinners. We are to know God's method of making a sinner the kind of person that he wants that person to be. Justification merely declares a person righteous. Remove the guilt of sin. It did not, and I emphasize that, it did not eradicate the old sin nature. Those who are saved have been given a new nature. You know what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I believe, 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, man or woman, boy or girl, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are to know that we were buried with Christ and raised with him. God wants the saved person to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to count on the thing that God has said unto us. God has done exactly what he said he was going to do. We are to reckon it to be true. Count on it. If God said it, then God performed it, then it is true. Now, in the book of Romans, Chapter 6, we will pick up today with verse number, I believe, 13. For the Apostle Paul sh shared with us, says, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness under sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instrument of righteousness unto God. Don't present your members as instrument of unrighteousness. This word, yield, I uh, use the word present, you can use the either word. This word, yield or present, is used in Romans chapter 1. When Paul will write into the Romans in chapter 12, I said chapter 1, but chapter 12, verse 1, he said to them, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your reasonable worship. Don't yield, talking to Christians now, don't yield to the old nature. You see, by an act of the will, we can yield ourselves to do God's will through the new nature. 
I think I've said before, if I haven't, I'm saying it now. There is no power in the new nature to live the Christian life. We still need help. Following the dictate of the old nature will get us in trouble every time. Uh, there's a story that was put out by some gentleman. A uh, story of a little girl who fell out of bed one night. And her mother asked her, says, why? Why did you fall out of bed? She said, I guess I stayed too close to the edge. Well, Krishna, we can't walk on the peripheral and say that we are walking in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we might be living too close to the edge of not being obedient unto the Lord. I have a question. What your issue? I know mine. You know, we might have a list of several things that just given us fits. After all, we are not immune to problems. You know what we need to do with our problem, don't you? Take it to Jesus. I don't know. I don't mean to stop and pick on a certain uh, sin. I don't have a pet list of sin, but there are some things that people are still doing as Christian. I'm not saying you're doing it. People are still gossiping. That little tongue just wags sometimes. Sometimes it destroys other people's other people's lives. People are still lying. People are still bearing false witness against one another. What's your issue? Whatever it is that's going on in your life and you don't like it as a child of God and you don't like it, you just would, would to God that it was not so. Take it to the Lord and let him deal with it. You see, we have to walk in this earth or on this earth rubbing shoulder to shoulder with others. Some Christians, some who are not. When the Lord saved us, he did not take us out of this world. He left us here. And while we are here, we are to demonstrate that a change has taken place. Paul goes on to say in verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion, have power over you. For you are not under the law, but what? Under grace. You see, the law was given to control the old nature. Now, we have a new nature. We are to yield or present ourselves unto God. What a wonderful privilege to take it to the Lord. Paul asked a question in verse 15, chapter 6, Romans. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? But under grace? Oh, he answered that question hurriedly. He said, God forbid. May it not be so. 
Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? I have found out that I cannot live the Christian life on my own. May I say, hurriedly, neither can you. You might think you can, but you can't. I need help. When it comes to living this Christian life, I need help. You see, Jesus has to live his life in me and through me. It won't work any other way. If you try to live this Christian life on your own, you're going to fail and living the life that a Christian should live. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. You see, it's not how you walk, but where you walk. Are you walking in the light today? Are you walking in fellowship with Christ? Sin will break the fellowship. Of course, we are to talk to Jesus about any sin that we recognize in our lives. If we want to continue in fellowship with the Lord. The Lord Jesus said to Peter in the upper room, Jesus was coming around. He told them that he was going to wash their feet. He had his towel and he had his basin of water. And when he got to Peter, Peter said unto him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash you not, you have no part with me. Now notice he didn't say you have no part in me, but he said you have no part with me. I don't know about you, but I want to continue to walk in fellowship with my Lord, with my Savior. You see, Jesus' part is cleansing. Our part is confessing to him. When we recognize that we have been disobedient to him, don't tell me, Christian, don't, don't, don't listen to me and say, well, I don't do anything wrong. You just probably did something wrong. You probably didn't tell the truth. See, it's okay to talk to Jesus daily about your sin. In John 1, 9, now I used to didn't understand how to use this verse, but I'm going to read this verse now. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, it's A-N-S, he faithful, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we are to please him, not ourselves. Paul went on to ask in verse 16, chapter 6 from Romans, Know you not that to whom you yield or present yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness see what it boils down to is your choice we're serving someone today the question is, who are 
you serve? Who am I serving? Is it self? Is it Satan? Or is it the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of them name all the different ones that you, that people serve? But I named at least three. I can either serve myself. I can continue to serve Satan. Or by the power, the aid of the Holy Spirit, I can serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Back to the question. Who are you serving today? Now, let me go back and read verse, uh, I believe, verse 16 one more time. In verse number 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield or present yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I made your statement. I, I made your statement. It's your choice. It's my choice. We get to verse 17, and Paul used those two exclusive, exclusive words that I like to look at as I read the Bible, no matter what is going on. When God comes on the scene, when God gets involved, God can make a difference. He used the word but God many times, but now, but then. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, S-I-N. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You see, when we were lost, we did what came naturally. We did what pleased us. But when you have a new nature, which the Lord has given to us, you can obey Christ. Paul came to this conclusion in Romans 7, 18. And here's what he said. Why know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing? For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. See, when the old Adamic nature is still ruling, we are going to have insurmountable as far as we are concerned problems. You see, you can do a lot to improve the flesh, but you can't make it look good. We need to realize that there is no power, I think I made that statement a little earlier, in the new nature. This is the reason that we have to walk by faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can produce the Christian life in us and through us. Verse 18. Being then made free from S-I-N. 
I know it's provided didn't say being then made free from S-A-N-S because you know what? Christians still disobey the Lord from time to time. Christians still commit sins. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. See, in saving us, in giving us the Holy Spirit, the Lord set us free from the power and penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Well, you know what scripture says, the wages of sin is death. Yes, it's true. We have been liberated. We've been set free. He has made it possible for us to live the Christian life. Mind you, once again, not in our own power, not in our own strength, but we need the power. We need the energy of the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that sin has been eradicated or resolved. But I tell you what it does mean. It means that now we can live for God with the aid of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way to live a Christian life. Now I know some are going to disagree with me here. That's all right. I love you still. I know there are those who have their little pet rules and little pet uh, do's and little pet don'ts. And when they observe these things, they call it this living the Christian life. But to live the Christian life as it ought to be lived, as it should be lived, as God intends for it to be lived, I must live it in the power with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Paul went on to say in verse 6 and verse 19, rather in chapter 6, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants are slaves to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now. Yield your members, servants, or slaves to righteousness unto holiness. I'm going to read Romans uh, 6, verses 20. Through 23, I believe, together before I come back and make any statement. Let me read verse number 20. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Verse 21. What fruit had you then? in those things whereof you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is what? You know what it is. It's death. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting. Do you hear that? Life. Verse 23. And you know what Romans 6 23 says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God 
I said 3.23 am, really want to read 6.23. 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let me go back to verse 20 and make several comments on 20, 21, 22, possibly 23. Verse 20 again. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. We didn't think of serving Christ then. We were not interested in serving him. None whatsoever. Paul says, then you were free from righteousness. Then he asks a question in verse 21. What fruit of the Romans? He said, what fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Paul is saying, not only were you free from Christ before you came to Christ, you were free from him, you were free from any law, any rule, any regulation that he had given. He said, you also were fruitless. You didn't have any fruit unto righteousness. You did what you wanted to do, when you wanted to do it, and how you wanted to do it. In other words, you pleased yourself. You see, the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil is that a child of the devil loves doing what the devil want done. But to the child of God, it's heartbreaking. When we fall short of the glory of God by disobeying him and we realize that we have disobeyed him, it breaks our heart. Well, that's the way it should be. Back to verse 20, I believe verse 22 now. But now, being made free from sin, we are free from the penalty of sin and eternal death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have fruit unto holiness and the, uh, and the end everlasting life. You see, the Christian is under new management. The Christian has a new owner. The Christian now has a new master. A loving master, mind you, a kind and benevolent master who wants the best for that person. You see, the devil is the paymaster for those who continue to walk in his camp. He is the paymaster and he will see to it that you get paid. If you work for him, his wages, his payoff is death. Now I'm coming back to that verse we read earlier, Romans 6, 23, where Paul points out to us today, as he pointed out to people of his day and all down through many generations 
for the wages of sin is death. There's another side to this. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Which one do you want today? Do you want to get paid? In the wages of sin, for the wages of sin is death. You want death? When I say death, I'm not talking about just physical death here. I'm talking about spiritual death eternal death. See, there is a spiritual death when the spirit is separated from the body. The spirit goes back to be with the Father along with the soul. The body goes in the ground. That's one kind of death. And then there is a spiritual death. I don't know about you today, but I want spiritual life. And then there is an eternal death. That is a total separation from God. And when you continue to walk in a way that totally in disobedience to what God has said, what God has done, you will earn eternal death. Now in chapter 7, we're going to look at the shackles of a saved soul. The struggle of a saved soul. And I just want to introduce a little bit of chapter 7 and 8 by going to verse number 24. Romans 7, 24. Paul this apostle, this saint, this great teacher, this great and dynamic preacher, cried out in verse 24, chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. What brought this cry from his lips? He knew that he was saved. He knew that he had been brought out of darkness. He knew that he had been brought into God's marvelous light. He had already said to the saints at Thessalonica, I hope I pronounced that word right, in chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, he said, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. He went on to say, You are all the children of light, and the children of of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Paul knew that God wanted the very best for him. He knew that the Lord would never leave him nor forsake him. He knew that the Lord loved him. He knew that God's grace was sufficient for him. 
He knew that he, that Jesus had gone back to glory to prepare a home for him. He understood what Jesus meant when he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 3 of John 14, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. Paul knew all of these things. Of course, he knew many other things too. Yet, You hear him crying out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Or another way of saying that, this body of death. This human nature. which was received or inherited, if you will, from Adam. You see, in Adam, we inherited what we have in the line of death. We inherited guilt and sin from Adam. Paul knows there have there hangs over his life a cloud of guilt and death which is imputed with sin. See, just as righteousness have been imputed unto us because God justifies us. When he justifies us, he imputes the righteousness of Christ to our account. Because Adam sinned and we follow suit, death is also imputed with sin. You see, this is the cry of a saved man. Some say, oh, Paul wasn't saved when he uttered that cry in, in Romans 7, 24. Oh, yes, he was. He was a saved man. Maybe he hadn't reached a stage that he ultimately would reach later on in his life, but he was still a saved man. You see, Paul is exhausted because of the struggle. He's helpless. He needs some outside help to live the Christian life. Just like you and I today need that outside help to live the Christian life. I'm going to read one more verse and then we're going to close this Bible study. I'm going to read Romans chapter 7 verse 25. After asking that question, who shall deliver me from this body of death or from the body of this death? Paul went on to cry out in verse 25, I thank God. Oh, every now and then we ought to just thank God for what he has done. Thank him for what he is doing. Thank him for what he has promised to keep on doing for his children. Back to 725. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself 
serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul said, there's something going on here. I need some help. I don't understand it all, but I know it's there. When I would do right, evil is always present. He says, I thank God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I say to you now, sisters, brothers, those who are listening, I thank God today. He didn't have to deliver my soul. He didn't have to save me. He didn't have to give me his marvelous salvation, but he did. And oh, do I thank him? Do I ever thank him? I praise him. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's why I can say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless his holy name. And all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I don't mean one benefit, all his benefits. There may be some that I know not of right now, but thank him, praise him, bless him for all of his benefits that he has given. I say now, Father, thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your everlasting mercy your marvelous mercy thank you for your grace thank you for your love thank you for wanting the best for me even when I didn't want the best for myself because I didn't know what was the best for myself but you knew what was the best for me Thank you. Father, we thank you for taking care of your children, wherever your children are, whatever they're going through right now. We thank you for taking care of your own. We thank you, Father, that one day you're going to call us off the face of this earth. You're going to call us from this walk of life. You're going to take us home to live with you forever. We thank you. May all of the glory be thine. Let us continue to praise you, exalt you, worship you. Lord, just let me lift up your name wherever I am. Let me lift up your name because you are worthy. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen.